Art on Demand is a production of the Cultural Arts Alliance of Walton County, brought to you with support from Alice Beach and 30A.com. While these events are provided at no cost to you, we do ask that you donate what you can by visiting our website, culturalartsalliance.com, in order to help the CAA continue to foster creativity, employ artists, and bring you entertainment, education, and engagement through Art on Demand. We hope you love this virtual event. My name is Heather Clements, and I'm a full-time professional artist. In the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna teach you how to kickstart your ability to draw light and shadow. A little about me, I've been an artist my entire life, always been passionate about it. I got my degree in painting from the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, and I have been a full-time professional artist and instructor for the past 10 years. And for many of those 10 years, I have been a member of the Cultural Arts Alliance and participated in many exhibits as well as taught multiple workshops for the CAA. So today's lesson, kickstarting your way to understanding light and shadow. I'm going to start out um, explaining really how light and shadow work to you so that you are better able to see and understand it. And then I'll break down to you the steps of how to actually draw and capture light and shadow in your own works. And then we'll end with an exercise so that you can fully grasp it by practicing it. I like to keep the supplies for these things super simple, so just about anybody can do them. All you need, paper and pencil. Be good to get a couple of sheets of paper out, maybe one for notes and a couple for the exercise. And really any pencil will do. A drawing pencil is great, but it could be any pencil. And you could use an eraser or not, eraser optional. Understanding light and shadow. First off, this is generally what people are referring to when they talk about shading. How do I shade in my artwork? Well, the first thing that you really need to know is shading is generally laying in shadows and it's super beneficial to actually understand those shadows. It's important to start really considering your light source. Here we have our white sphere with a single strong light source. On the sphere itself, the area that is pretty much in the light is called our light area. The lightest part of that, which is very white, is our highlight, which is really a direct reflection of the light source on the light side of the form. As the light loses its strength, as the form shifts away from the light source, it turns into our shadow area. This is a form shadow. That's what makes a form shadow, where the light loses its strength as the form turns away from the light source. Over here we have our cast shadow. A cast shadow is where the light source is directly blocked by an object. How light works is it comes and it hits objects and it bounces all over the place. So as the light bounces off of the surface of the table, it bounces back onto the other side of the form, making this our reflected light. It's on the shadow side, but see how light this reflected light is. Looking for and capturing reflected light in your drawings is going to make a huge difference in giving what you're drawing depth and three-dimensionality. So be on the lookout for these reflected lights. Notice my reflected light over here and see what happens when I take the white paper away from it. It becomes much darker, and that's because the light cannot bounce off of the dark surface nearly as well as it reflects off of a light surface. Now the cast shadow has a part down here called the oculus shadow, where it's at its darkest because there's less reflected light bouncing around able to hit that spot. Notice that the form shadow is very soft. It blends from light to dark gradually, whereas our cast shadow here has much sharper lines to it. The lines will be sharpest closest to the object and get blurry as it goes farther away from the object due to more reflected light around it. Let's look at the highlight. If the lighting source stays the same, but I move around the object, my light area will not move. However, if I move around the object, the highlight itself 
will. Let's see what happens if I draw a dot on my highlight and we move around the object. Watch as the highlight moves as I move around the object. The lit area hasn't changed at all, but my highlight is now here. Now let's talk about value, or the term value as it pertains to drawing and painting. Value basically refers to how light or how dark something is. Here I have drawn a value scale. I've shaded in from light to dark. So this side would be our light values, where it's darker would be your dark values, in between would be your medium values. Sometimes it's easiest to break it down into a certain number of values, like 10. One will be the white of our paper and 10 will be as dark as we can draw. If I say something only has two values, it might just have, say, a one and a four only. On the other hand, if I say something has a lot of values or a full range of values, it might have everything one all the way through 10. It will include the lightest lights, the darkest darks, and everything in between. Now let's talk a little bit about local value versus light shadow value. Local value is essentially the values on the subject itself, while light shadow value is created from the light source. For example, let's look at this cup. The local values would be the white that covers most of the cup and the pattern that you see on it. Those are the local values. Now the light shadow value is going to change depending on your light source. You'll have a light side and a shadow side. Here you'll see that I've made a drawing of the local values only. And then I made a drawing of the light shadow values only. And then in the third drawing, I have included both a combination of the local values and the light shadow values. Most finished drawings will have a combination of these two things. But now that you know the difference between local and light shadow values, today we're going to focus mainly on all white surfaces so that we're able to hone in only on the light shadow value created from a light source and not have to deal with the added challenge of the local values. So now that we understand uh, how light works a little bit better and values and the different kinds of values, uh, how do you actually draw it? How I recommend you tackle light and shadow is by beginning with just two values. For example, here I have a still life with all white objects, again, to eliminate the added challenge of local value. When approaching this drawing, I would begin with only two values. The light would be the white of the paper and the dark would be the shadows, both cast shadows and form shadows. You want to simplify your light and shadow from the beginning so that you can slowly go and break it down farther and farther. Always with drawing, you want to start with general things first, right? Larger shapes before tiny details. The same goes for drawing light and shadow. And you'll find that with just those two values of light and dark, you'll have a very strong sense of your light source. This will help you as you develop your drawing to keep that sense of light source rather than just, ooh, kind of random lights and darks here and there, and you're not really sure exactly how they relate to the overall sense of light. But those two main values that you start with help set the tone for your overall sense of lighting. So to simplify it all into two values, you're going to have to make some decisions. What is light? What is dark? Where I choose to make something light or dark might differ slightly from where you would. For example, if you look at the sphere, rather than at the beginning capturing the subtle fade from light to dark, I picked a line somewhere in the middle of that fade and I just said that the bottom part was dark and the top part was light. Same thing with the cylinder. There's a fade from light to dark there, but I just chose a line in the middle of that, shaded one dark and one light. The in-between values will come later. Where I decide to draw that line on that cylinder might differ a little bit from where you or the next person might decide to draw it. And that's okay, that doesn't matter that much. You just wanna get that overall sense 
of light and shadow. Once you have those two main values in there and you have a strong sense of your light source on your page, now you can start to fill in more and more values. But you don't want to rush into trying to capture your full range of values right off the bat. So I would encourage you to add one or two more values to this. You'll see in my example, I start picking out some of the even darker shadows and cast shadows and darkening the background as well. After you've got some more values in there, you can continue adding more and more values. And this is where you really want to pay attention to that value scale again and trying to capture your full range of values. I'll have the white of the paper, which is my lightest lights, and the darkest darks as well. A full range will help give a lot of depth to your image. As you're drawing, it's good to give a scan to your object. Pick out where are my lightest lights on this? Where are my darkest darks? And fill those in just as you see them. Let's bring it back again to our value scale. Most beginners, when they start shading, their entire drawing usually only actually consists of just a few values, maybe just three, like a two, a six, and a nine, or a three, a five, and an eight. What you want to aim for for more realistic depiction is that full range of value all the way from the lightest lights to the darkest darks and everything in between. Looking back at my drawing of the still life, I started out with two values. In this case, a one and a four. The one, which is just the white of my paper, and the four is kind of a middle value that I use to represent my shadows. My shadows start at not very dark because it's easier to go darker than it is to go lighter. Going lighter means that you're erasing a lot, and if you go too dark too soon, you might not be able to erase all the way. As I progressed some in my drawing and laid down a little bit more values, I also picked out a level seven and I simply left my value one and my value four. Then in my more final drawing, you should be able to pick out all of the range of values throughout my entire drawing. I have very white whites, I have very dark darks, and I have a lot of different levels in between. So laying in those initial two values gives you that strong sense of where your light source is coming from and then adding more and more values and the full range of values will give you more depth and a more realistic depiction. So while I want you to keep in mind for the future the full range of values, for today I really want us to just focus on the beginning step, the capturing of the two values, light and dark. Breaking down your drawing into just those two values will be an immensely helpful tool, especially when you get into drawing things that are much more complex than the example of the simple geometric shapes. For example, let's say you're drawing a figure. Human form is known as one of the most complex things that you can draw. In this drawing, you'll notice it's only two values, the white of the paper and a shaded shadow value. There is a line drawn between light and dark. Even though this is only two values, you have a very strong sense of where the light is coming from, and you start to get a sense of the form as well. When you are drawing your line in between light and dark, I would encourage you to fully embrace every little peak and value and curve and jagged part because the light doesn't lie. All of those nuances are describing the form. That bump might be muscle or bone or flesh. It is through that varied line between light and dark that we start to see a knee or a face. And you can see these things just from showing the line between light and dark. So when you see something and you're like, I don't understand why there's this weird dark triangle here, draw it as you see it. Trust what you see and draw it like that. In this example, again, the figure itself is only in two values, and you can very clearly see that the light source is coming from high above. When you're drawing this, again, it's up to you to decide exactly where that line is between light and dark. Yours might fall a little bit this way or a little bit that way. Either way is okay, as long as you're trying to make that distinction between light and dark. And if you have an area that's a total number five medium value, it's up to you to decide if you want to describe it as light or dark. So after the video ends, I want you to create an exercise. You're going to draw a crumpled piece of paper. 
I'll show you the demo of mine here in a minute. Why draw a crumpled piece of paper, you'll probably ask. Two main reasons. One, we don't have assumptions for exactly what a specific piece of crumpled paper in a specific way looks like. Um, and that allows us to not be left brain drawing where you're trying to force what you're drawing to match the symbol of what you have in your head of it. For example, a hand or an eye. We have symbols in our head for what we think these things should look like and it can often create a battle in our minds while we're drawing if this doesn't look like what a hand looks like or what an eye looks like. So if you're drawing something that looks much more abstract and you know that depending on how it's crumpled it's going to look totally different ways, you're able to ignore any assumptions you might have of what you think it's supposed to look like and you're more able to just see what it looks like itself. Plus, you know that it's gonna look kind of like a crumpled mess on your paper. So you're not gonna have these expectations of an amazing hand or eye drawing, but just an abstract crumpling of shapes and shadows. Two, it is a great way of creating a variety of values in an all white surface. That is something that pretty much everybody has in their house already. So here is my drawing of a crumpled piece of paper. For this exercise, you're going to just need a piece of paper to draw on, an extra piece of paper, a pencil, and a strong light source. You can use a clamp light, adjustable directional desk lamp, or even just any old lamp with the shade taken off so you have the exposed light bulb to make it a really nice strong light source. Then you're just going to take your extra piece of paper and you're going to crumble it. Now I'm not going to crumple it too terribly much to make too much complicated wrinkles and crinkles out of it, but get some good crumple action going and then maybe go ahead and place it with my light source. Um, I like it coming from the side and above a little bit. And then I'm just going to play around and find a good angle for it. Uh, I might suggest that you try to get about roughly equal parts uh, lit areas to shadow areas. I find that is a good balance for this exercise. And you can also, of course, adjust your light source um, to create more shadows as well. So then I'm going to roughly sketch in the contours. And again, contours are basically the lines of the drawing. After I lay that in is when I'm going to work in with my shadows. My angle that I'm drawing from is going to be a little different than the angle that you're seeing the video from. Notice I'm going rather quickly and lightly and I'm not being really particular about my shapes yet. I've got my overall shapes in there and now I'm going to go in uh, again and pick out those lines and shapes a little bit more specifically with a little more detail too, but without jumping into that detail too quickly. Now that I have a lot of my basic contours in here, I'm going to pick out where the shadows are and kind of outline where I'm going to see those shadows. And I can kind of shade that in as I go so that I don't get confused later of what's light and what's shadow. Remember the point of this exercise is to just see light and dark to start. Don't worry about all of the other values in between, just try to simplify what you see into either light or dark and there will be areas that are kind of medium and in between and it's really up to you on whether you think it should be expressed as light or dark. Thank you. 
So here I have my main shadows laid out in my drawing. Notice I have just the two values, the white of the paper and the dark of the shadows. Although it might also be nice to throw in the cast shadow of my piece of paper on the table. Now if I were to keep working on this drawing, I would pick out a whole lot of other values in between here. I would pick out some of my darkest darks and some of my lightest highlights. But breaking it down into just the light side and the shadow sides helps us really understand the direction of the light and how it falls on the form and how it is blocked in cast shadows as well. After you make that drawing, if you're into it, keep going. Make more drawings. Take your crumpled piece of paper and rotate it. It'll look totally different. Or move the angle of your light source, or both, or crumple a new piece of paper. Doing something like this over and over will be excellent practice for seeing and understanding light and shadows. Then, if you're still into it, you can do this exact same exercise, starting the same way, where you only do two values in the whole drawing, and then you can progress into adding more and more values, ideally maybe ending with the full range of values, all the way from the lightest lights to the darkest darks and everything in between. And I would love to see your drawings from this exercise. So you can share them online with the hashtag sketchbooking with Heather or email them to me at heatherclementsart at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this lesson and want to learn more from me, I've got classes and workshops, including some free online classes. If you want to look into those, check out my site at heatherclementsart.com. Well, that concludes our lesson. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you again, everybody that watched. This was really fun. Happy drawing. Thank you for experiencing this episode of Art on Demand, presented by the Cultural Arts Alliance of Walton County, with support from Alice Beach and 30A.com. We hope you explored your creativity and learned something new today. As the creative core of Walton County, the CAA offers support, connection, and access opportunities for all forms of art, every variety of maker, all levels of learners, and especially art lovers. Through performance, funding, and educational programs, the 501c3 organization directly connects the people of Walton County with the broader view, the critical exploration, and the answers only the arts have the power to provide. If you loved this episode, please visit culturalartsalliance.com and click the donate button to give what you can to help the CAA continue to bring you art on demand. And stay tuned for our next virtual event coming soon.